Sanger, together with her sister, Ethel Brine, Baron? Baron. 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 Baron? Sure. I've heard it always. We're just going to call her Ethel! Welcome. Welcome to the Naked Apple Slices of History. This slice of history is uh, brought to you by Margaret Sanger. Ah. Yeah. The, uh, one of the primary founders of what is now called Planned Parenthood. She, uh, she is relevant today in today's history because, well, the Supreme Court is at some point in the next couple of months going to drop a ruling on Roe versus Wade, which if it goes the way of the leaked document, uh, will be uh, letting the states decide, which is how it should be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but with that, almost every time something like this comes up around abortions and Planned Parenthood, her history eventually comes up because, well, she's a racist. No, she wasn't racist. She hated children. She didn't hate children. We decided, let's find out. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it's just, it just gets a little dark. Yeah. A little, a little dark. Uh, and we'll dig Just in. a little. A little bit on the, uh, the dark, uh, closer to the uh, other side of the moon <laughs> than... Um, <laughs> than one would be comfortable with. Than burnt toast. But, you know, <laughs> close enough. <laughs> close enough. So, without further ado... Uh, let's get, get right it. into it. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, let's start out with a question. A question. I like yes. questions. I've got, I've got a question. What do Nancy Pelosi, Hillary Clinton, Ted Turner, Jane Fonda, Catherine Hepburn, John Rockefeller, Martin Luther, Martin, wow, <laughs> Martin Luther King, and Lyndon B. Johnson all have in common? They were born before I was. That is true. Ha! That is true. <laughs> that, a is a, that is a thing they have in common. I get a prize. Um, asking a generic question, looking for a specific answer. <laughs> you get generically dumb you answers. You get generically dumb answers. <laughs> the specific answer that I was fishing for. They are all recipients of the Margaret Sanger Award from Planned Parenthood. Oh, that's n- nice. Yeah. I guess. I guess. What, what do they receive that award for, anyway? Oh, they're wonderful... Something or other. They're wonderful <laughs> something or other. <laughs> you asked a specific question. <laughs> According to Planned Parenthood, our highest honor, the Planned Parenthood Federation of America Margaret Sanger Award is presented annually to recognize leadership, excellence, and outstanding contributions to the reproductive health and rights movement. Ah, so it's an award that you buy. Yeah. Ah. Well, now that we've cleared that up, <clears throat> so so good of them to uh, to do that. Yes, yeah. So Planned Parenthood takes its place on the stage from time to time, primarily whenever abortions become the topic of debate among the masses. Um, that's in large part due to it being the largest abortion provider in the United States, doling out some three hundred and fifty thousand abortions each year that's nice and it's spending over a million dollars a year in lobbying official official lobbying yeah uh not including its its gifts yes. and things like exactly. that exactly um, or donations to or other places donations that, yeah. right exactly while receiving around 600 million dollars in government grants and reimbursements hmm. Usually when this organization and abortion come up, the focus turns to one of its founders, which we mentioned earlier, Margaret Sanger. Woohoo! So who is Margaret Sanger? A well, wonderful, beautiful woman. I mean, she's dead, so I don't know about beautiful <laughs> or, you know, any of those things anymore. <laughs> but if we go to Planned Parenthood's website, they are kind enough to give a brief history of her. So quoting... From their website, Planned Parenthood traces its roots back to a nurse named Margaret Sanger. Sanger grew up in an Irish family of 11 children in Corning, New York. No wonder she was (laughs) pro-abortion. 
she couldn't get anything to eat. <laughs> Her mother, in fragile health from many pregnancies, including seven miscarriages, good heavens, yeah, died at age 50 of tuberculosis. <clears throat> Her mother's story, along with her work as a nurse on the Lower East Side of New York, inspired Sanger to travel to Europe and study birth control methods at a time when educating people about birth control was illegal in the United States. So most of it was sterilization. Ah. Yeah. Oh, well. So. Yeah. Okay. At least at that time. I love that they just refer to, you know, abortion as blanket birth control. <laughs> on October 16th, 1916, Sanger, together with her sister, Ethel Brine, Bairn? Bairn. 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 Bairn? Sure. I've heard it always. We're just going to call her Ethel. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the activist, Fania Mendel, <clears throat> opened the country's first birth control clinic in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Women lined up down the block to get birth control information and advice from Sanger, Ethel, and Mendel. <laughs> Nine days later, police raided the clinic and shut it down. All three women were charged with crimes related to sharing birth control information. Sanger refused to pay the fine and spent 30 days in jail while she educated, or where she educated other inmates about birth control. <clears throat> Although the Brownsville Clinic was shut down, Sanger went on to travel the country to share her vision, a vision that had deeply harmful blind spots. Sanger believed in eugenics an inherently racist and ableist ideology that labeled certain people unfit to have children. Eugenics is the theory that society can be improved through planned breeding for desirable traits like intelligence and industriousness. In the early 20th century, eugenic ideas were popular among highly educated, privileged, and mostly white Americans. <laughs> <clears throat> I wonder yeah, how much I it wonder. burned their fingers to type this out. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm sure that they probably just copy and pasted it off of Wikipedia. <clears throat> <laughs> Margaret Sanger pronounced her belief in and alignment with the eugenics movement many times in her writings, especially in the scientific journal Birth Control Review. At times, Sanger tried to argue for eugenics that was not applied based on race or religion. But in a society built on the belief of white supremacy, physical and mental fitness are always judged based on race. Yes, because there isn't a black man out there that isn't better at every sport on the planet <laughs> than oh. pretty much every white guy. Oh, hockey. Yes, but that doesn't involve actually running. That involves using... Sliding. Skates. Momentum. Momentum. <laughs> That's different. And the, and the maintenance and or also, transfer thereof. <laughs> I mean, have you seen Cool Runnings? That's... <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Eugenics, therefore, is inherently racist. She held beliefs that, from the very beginning, undermined her movement... For reproductive freedom and caused harm to countless people. Sanger was so intent on her mission to advocate for birth control that she chose to align herself with ideas and organizations that were ableist and white supremacist. In 1926, she spoke to the women's auxiliary of the Ku Klux Klan, KKK, at a rally in New Jersey to promote birth control methods. Sanger endorsed the 1927 Buck v. Bell decision in which the Supreme Court ruled that states would forcibly sterilize people deemed unfit without their consent and sometimes without their knowledge. The acceptance of this decision by Sanger and other thought leaders laid the foundation for tens of thousands of people to be sterilized, often against their will. As a result of these choices, the reproductive rights movement, in many cases, deepened racial injustice in the healthcare system. The field of modern gynecology was founded by J. Marion Sims, who in the mid-1800s repeatedly and forcibly performed invasive experiments on enslaved black women without anesthesia. Sounds like a wonderful human being. <laughs> yes. In 1939, Sanger began what was called the Negro Project, alongside black leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary McLeod Bethune. 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 
Yes. Yes. And Reverend Adam Clayton Powell. I wonder if he's relating, related to a certain Colin hmm. that we know of. I don't know. The mission of the Negro Project was to put black doctors and nurses in charge of birth control clinics to reduce mistrust of a racist health care system. Sanger lost control of the project, and black women were sent to white doctors for birth control and follow-up appointments, deepening the racist and paternalistic problems of health care in the South. Continuing to this day, black women's experiences and pain are too often dismissed or ignored by doctors and other health care providers, which, alongside historical dehumanization of black people, contributes to staggering and avoidable disparities in health outcomes. Planned Parenthood believes that all people of every race, religion, gender, identity, ability, immigration status, and geography are full human beings, except for fetuses, <laughs> with the right to determine their own future and decide without coercion or judgment or abortion whether and when to have children. Margaret Sanger's racism and belief in eugenics are in direct opposition to Planned Parenthood's mission. Is it though? Uh, mm. Is it though? <laughs> Hashtag doubt. <laughs> Hashtag shade. <laughs> Planned Parenthood denounces Margaret Singer's belief in eugenics. Further, Planned Parenthood denounces the history and legacy of anti blackness and gynecology and the reproductive rights movement and the mistreatment that continues against black, indigenous, and other people of color in this country. Which is, of course, why the statistics show that the people that they give abortions to the most are... Of course. Of course. Anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, it's, it's purely coincidence that the places that they build their clinics are almost exclusively... It's, it's, uh, it's at least, happenstance. At least that's the history of her they've shared since sometime after March 6th, 2021. Before that time, they failed to mention how racist it was of her to hold the views she had on eugenics and her interactions with groups like the KKK. Yeah, if you uh, copy-paste that link into the uh, Wayback Machine, uh. it uh, <clears throat> it took me a while to find it because obviously I had to go back to March 6, 2021 to figure it out. But that's the last entry before it's changed to what it is now, and it ends right after the Brownsville Clinic was raided. That's the end of the beginning. Is that when it was? And then it switches to the movement begins development of the pill, which is all also on the current page. So they just skip entirely how racist it was for Margaret Sanger to be racist. I mean, she's not racist. Of course she's not. <laughs> Of course, she's not at all. <laughs> For a bit more understanding on her background, though, um, before getting into some of her own words, we would be amiss if we didn't look into some of the history of eugenics and where it tied into Margaret's agenda. Yes. So there is a wonderful, wonderful website, genome.gov. Yeah. It's uh, National Human Genome Research Institute. Um Brought to you by the NIH, so take it with whatever grain of salt you want with that due to recent events. But <clears throat> um, they have a brief history on eugenics, and they tried to say that it was uh, taken askew from its original idea on stuff, which it probably was because most things are. Anyway, Francis Galton, uh, Charles Darwin's cousin, derived the term eugenics from the Greek word eugenes, meaning good in birth or good in stock. Uh, hmm. bad start. <laughs> Galton first used the term in an 1883 book, Inquiries into Human Fertility and Its Development. Francis Galton, uh, uh, Charles Darwin's cousin, derived the term eugenics from the Greek word eugene. Why do they say that twice? Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because it's the uh, DNIH. That's true. We paid them for this. We greatly want to. We greatly want a brief word to express the science of improving stock, which is by no means confined to questions of judicious mating, but which, especially in the case of man, takes cognizance of all influences that tend to that tend, in however remote a degree, to give to the more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing speedily over the less suitable than they otherwise would have had. The word eugenics would sufficiently express the idea. 
Galton believed that eugenics could control human evolution and development. In his writings, he argued that abstract social traits, such as intelligence, were a result of heredity. In his book, he claimed that, the, that only, quote, higher races, end quote, could be successful. Galton's writings reflected prejudiced notions about race, class, gender, and the overwhelming power of heredity. Oh, we don't really have to guess how he feels about euthanasia. Yeah. Fast forward a bit to 1924. In the early 20th century, immigration was a key political issue in the United States. Most immigrants came from non-English speaking countries, such as Italy and Poland. These new immigrants mostly settled in cities where people believed overcrowding strained the urban infrastructure. An illustration for article, an alien anti-dumping bill in the literacy di- uh, in the literary digest from May is pictured, and it's basically a giant funnel funnel from Europe to the United States with Uncle Sam only allowing 3% in. Putting a little gate in the funnel. Yeah, a little gate, and Europe is all packed in, crowded, and yeah. Eugenics, eugenicists, including Laughlin, uh, remember that name, saw these new non-Nordic immigrants as undesirable compared to immigrants from Northern Europe. Hmm. And he spoke about the inherent criminality of non-Nordic immigrants before the U.S. Congress in 1921. (laughs) This is about Margaret Sanger. Why are you talking about Laughlin? Just just wait for it. (laughs) It it gets there. We get there. His testimony was key in the passing of the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act in 1924. The act placed a quota on the number of immigrants to the United States from Southern and Eastern Europe and completely excluded Asian immigrants. This act allowed for more immigration from Northern European countries. Hmm. Signed by uh, Calvin Coolidge. Hmm. 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 In 1926, the American Eugenics Society is established. Um, It grew out of a committee formed at the Second International Eugenics Congress in New York. It was formally established in 1926 by several prominent American eugenists, including eugenics record office director Laughlin, Madison Grant, author of the book The Passing of the Great Race. I'm sure that's a great book, seeing as how Adolf Hitler admired it. And the author thereof. Yeah. And Irving Fisher, Yale University economist, the American Eugenics Society exhibited exhibit at the Sesquicentennial Exposition in Philadelphia is pictured there. Good for them. The American Eugenics Society primary function was to educate people about the importance of eugenics. It sponsored events at local and state fairs, such as fitter family contests. Those were fun. Uh, that was a contest in which... People got together and tried to prove that their family was the more fit family. Or Oh, so it was like Family Feud? It was like Family Feud, except uh, they tried to prove that my baby is the perfect baby and yours is not. Things like that. Well, they're all wrong because my baby is the And the baby, winners so. were predominantly white people. Oh, well, you know... Um, And exhibits that illustrated Mendel's laws of inheritance and showed the economic costs of caring for, quote, mentally ill, end quote, children. It distributed several publications, including Eugenics, Eugenical News, and Eugenics Quarterly. At its its height in the 1930s, the organization had more than 1,200 members, including notable names like Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood. Hmm. Hmm. 1927, Buck v. Bell County, which we mentioned already before, but in 1924, Virginia's General Assembly passed the Eugenical Sterilization Act, (laughs) a law designed around model legislation that Laughlin had created. The law allowed the Commonwealth of Virginia to forcibly sterilize those deemed, quote, intellectually disabled, end quote. The same year, Albert Pretty, the superintendent of the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded, requested the authority to sterilize an 18-year-old patient, Carrie Buck. Her mother had a history of prostitution, and Buck had been raped by a relative and subsequently birthed a child. Buck was committed to the state colony and deemed, quote, feeble-minded, end quote. The legal case to sterilize Buck made it to the Supreme Court, who decided in an eight-to-one vote hmm, that it was in the Commonwealth's best interest to proceed with the sterilization. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the majority opinion saying, quote, It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, 
Society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. End quote. End quote. But yes, the Supreme Court has precedence and we can't change, quote, established law. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in that brief eugenics history, we highlighted the name Laughlin. And that's Harry Laughlin. So his work on eugenics was so influential that his work was used by Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime to formulate their sterilization laws. Oh, good. So at the same time that the Nazis were doing it, <laughs> hey, this Laughlin guy's got it figured out. He gets it. It was kind of happening here, too. Yeah. So the whole it couldn't happen here thing... Kind of already did once. We weren't far away from the Nazis, apparently. No. Uh, because of his work, the University of Heidelberg granted him an honorary doctorate of medicine in 1936, which he was more than happy to accept. And he hoped it meant there was a common understanding between German and American scientists in the research and application of eugenics. <laughs> 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 He and Margaret Sanger were close associates, working closely together to try to unite the eugenic movement and the birth control movement. For after all, they should be and are the right and left hand of one body. Margaret's words. Margaret's words. She also thought his involvement in the 1924 Immigration Restoration Act was a good thing. It's a good thing. To keep the doors of immigration closed to the entrance of certain aliens whose condition is known to be... Now you got me talking like Fauci. <laughs> <laughs> I was going for Bernie Sanders, but, you know, either way. Either way. Either way. <laughs> is known to be detrimental to the stamina of the race, such as feeble-minded, idiots, morons, insane, syphilitic, epileptic, criminal, professional prostitutes, and others in this class barred by immigration laws of 1924, end quote. So a, a, a fun note on this. Uh, Laughlin you know, hated all these people, thought they should be eliminated. Uh -huh. he, he developed epilepsy in his later years. <laughs> well, that just serves him right. <laughs> the irony. <laughs> and did he uh, change his views? Nope, he plowed forward and tried to hide his yeah. epilepsy. So now that we've tied that all together in a nice little bow... Let's dig into our dear Margaret's work to see more of who she is and the foundations she had laid leading into the founding of the organization currently known as Planned Parenthood, as opposed to the singer formerly known as Prince. <laughs> First, we have Margaret Sanger's A Plan for Peace. Oh, good. This is good. This should be good. This, this is good. Peace. This is great. This is great. And it mentions one of my favorite presidents, so it's going to be phenomenal. Oh, yeah. George Washington. Yeah. So, uh, quote, first, put into action President Wilson's 14 points. They misspelled Washington. Uh, nope, it was Wilson who came up with the atrocious 14 points. Oh, uh, Wilson. Upon which terms Germany and Austria surrendered to the Allies in 1918. Which also started World War II. Yeah. Second... Have Congress set up a special department for the study of population problems and appoint a parliament of population. The directors representing the various branches of science. This body to direct and control the population <laughs> through birth rates and immigration. Good crap. And to direct its distribution over the country according to national needs consistent with taste, fitness, and interest of individuals. The main objects of the Population Congress would be A, to raise the level and increase the general intelligence of the population, B, to increase the population slowly by keeping the birth rate at its present level of 15 per thousand, decreasing the death rate below its present mark of 11 per thousand, to keep the doors of immigration closed to the entrance of certain aliens, whose condition is known to be detrimental to the stamina of the race, such as feeble-minded, idiots, morons, insane, syphilitic, epileptic, criminal, professional, prostitutes, and others in this class barred by the immigration laws of 1924. D, 
to apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny is tainted. Eh, she said tainted. <laughs> or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to offspring. <laughs> e, to ensure the country against future burdens of maintenance for numerous offspring as may be born of feeble-minded parents by pensioning all persons with transmissible disease who voluntarily consent to sterilization. F, to give certain dysgenic groups in our population their choice of segregation or sterilization. G, to hey. apportion farmlands and homesteads for these segregated persons where they would be taught to work under competent instructors for the period of their entire lives. Hey, you're worthless <clears throat> to us. Do you want to be a sterilized... Or do you want to be sterilized? <laughs> would you like to be put in a corner by yourself, or would you like us to snip, snip? Either way, you're <laughs> going to end up on a farm. <laughs> Either way, you're going for to the a, rest of your life. Either way, you're going to a work camp, and you're going to work for all the elites. Yeah. Continuing on. Uh, the first step would thus be to control the intake and output of morons, <laughs> mental defectives, and epileptics. Well, that eliminates most of Congress. Yes, it does. The second step would be to take an inventory of the secondary group, such as illiterates, paupers, unemployables, criminals, prostitutes, dope fiends, classify them in special departments under government medical protection, and segregate them on farms and open spaces as long as necessary for the strengthening and development of moral conduct. You live here now. There's nothing here. Exactly. Go. You live there. <laughs> Wow. wow. <laughs> Having corralled this enormous part of our population and placed it on a basis of health instead of punishment, it is safe to say <laughs> that 15 or 20 millions of our population would then be organized into soldiers of defense, defending the unborn against their own disabilities. <laughs> the third step would be to give special attention to the mother's health. Where have I seen this before? This is for your health. This isn't punishment. This is for your health. To see that women who are suffering from tuberculosis, heart, or kidney disease, toxic goiter, gonorrhea, or any disease where the condition of pregnancy disturbs their health are placed under public health nurses to instruct them in practical scientific methods of contraception in order to safeguard their lives, thus reducing maternal mortality. Yeah, this is great. I'm, I'm having so much fun reading this. <laughs> the above steps may seem to place emphasis on a health program instead of an, on tariffs, moratoriums, and debts, but I believe that national health is the first essential factor in any program for universal peace. Hmm. With the future citizens safeguarded from hereditary taints, there it is. with five million mental and moral degenerates segregated, with 10 million women and 10 million children receiving adequate care, we could then turn our attention to the basic needs for international peace. Could we? <laughs> she was a globalist. Wow. No figure. A, glo a global socialist. There would then be a definite effort to make the population increase slowly and at a spe that. specified rate in order to accommodate and adjust increasing numbers to the best social and economic system. In the meantime, we should organize and join International League of Low Birth Rate Nations to secure and maintain world peace. <laughs> End <laughs> quote. Hey, we should all join together with people that aren't having children, and we'll have world peace by going up against countries that are having lots of children. You know, you know who's got it right? You know who's got it? The Chinese. Crushed it. Crushed they it. They crushed it. Yes, which is why they have the highest population of any country in the world. Hmm? Ha. What? Well. Hmm. Hmm. Well. <laughs> anyway, in her book, Woman and the New Race, after pointing out how more children in the home indicates a greater increase in death during the first year for the next child, she says, quote, Many, perhaps, will think it idle to go farther into in demonstrating the immorality of large families, but since there is still an abundance of proof at hand, it may be offered for the sake of those who find difficulty in adjusting old-fashioned ideas to the facts. 
The most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. The same factors which create the terrible infant mortality rate and which swell the death rate of children between the ages of one and five operate even more extensively to lower the health rate of the surviving members, end quote. <laughs> oh, it, gets, it only gets better from here. Yeah, yeah. Better. trying to find context for that, because when you find this quote, usually just find that one sentence, the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Pretty damning in and of itself. Then you go to find context for it, and it doesn't help. <laughs> wow, that's a really dark <laughs> sentence. Well, I wonder what uh, context that's but Oh, it got worse. She wants to ink. She wants to improve the infant mortality rate by killing more infants, but not counting them as infant mortality. But not counting it. Almost like counting it as an abortion after the baby is born. Yeah. Good uh, thing there's no states trying to do that right now. California. <laughs> Yeah. <coughs> so uh, in her autobiography, she describes her interactions with uh, certain organizations uh, that she went to for speaking engagements. Uh, quote, always to me, any aroused group was a good group. And therefore, I accepted an invitation to talk to the women's branch of the Ku Klux Klan. Hold up. <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> an aroused this group was a mm. good group. I <laughs> they got after Donald Trump for there's good people on both sides. Taken completely out of context. It's fine. It's fine. But Margaret fine. Sanger taken completely in context. No, she's not racist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she continues on. I was escorted to the platform, was introduced, and began to speak. Never before had I looked into a sea of faces like these. I was sure that if I uttered one word, such as abortion, outside the usual vocabulary of these women, they would go off into hysteria. And so my address that night had to be in the most elementary terms, as though I were trying to make children understand. She thought she was talking to idiots. Yes, basically. In the end, through simple illustrations, I believed I had accomplished my purpose. A dozen invitations to speak to similar groups were proffered. Not and just the quote. Not just the KKK, but similar groups too. The KKK. Yay! <laughs> but yeah. again, she's not racist. Yeah. Want, want to make sure that's established. Yeah. She she also went out of her way to make sure that uh, ministers were on board with her plans. Uh, she said, uh, "Quote: The minister's work is also important, and also he should be trained." perhaps by the Federation, as to our ideals and the goal that we hope to reach. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members, end quote. Who was that reverend that got the uh, Margaret Singer Award? <clears throat> it was Martin Luther King. Oh, interesting. Was that, that, that was senior. Was that senior or was that junior? That was junior. Is that Junior? It's Junior. Ooh. <laughs> it's an interesting tactic scene is how that's pretty much exactly what Hitler and the Nazis did. <laughs> what? Just, just a few what? years before she penned those words in her letter to Dr. Gamble. The very same Dr. Gamble who performed sterilization procedures in the U.S. and used his family's fortune to fund illegal experiments on oral sterilization pills in Puerto Rico, which ended up becoming birth control pills that are used by millions today. Huh. huh. Yeah, he's a fun one to research, too, if you go down that rabbit hole. He thought Puerto Ricans were... rats, at best, probably. Seeing as how he used them as lab rats. Yeah. And Puerto Rico became the most sterilized country in the world. Yeah. Mm. She also created uh, what she called a code for babies. And there's a few of those articles that stand out. Uh, quote, Article 3. A marriage license shall in itself give husband and wife only the right to a common whole household and not the right to parenthood. Excuse me? <laughs> Article 4. No woman shall have the legal right to bear a child. Oh! And no man shall have the right to become a father without a permit for parenthood. Article 5. 
Permits for parenthood shall be issued upon application by city, county, or state authorities to married couples, providing they are financially able to support the expected child, have the qualifications needed for proper rearing of the child, have no transmissible diseases, and, on the woman's part, no mat- medical indication that maternity is likely to result in death or permanent injury to health. Article 6. No permit for parenthood shall be valid for more than one birth. End quote. <laughs> ha! It, it's, an, it's a hot take uh, from her, considering that uh, Article 5 is what a lot of southern states use for marriage license things because they didn't want black people marrying white people. Ooh. But, you know, she's not racist. Not at all. So, to wrap up her contributions, let's go again to part of her summary and goal in her book, Woman and the New Race. Quote, Birth control itself, often denounced as a violation of natural law, is nothing more or less than the facilitation of the process of weeding out the unfit. (laughs) of preventing the birth of defectives or of those who will become defectives. So, in compliance with nature's working plan, we must permit womanhood its full development before we can expect efficient motherhood. If we are to make racial progress, this development of womanhood must precede motherhood in every individual woman. Then and then only can the mother cease to be an incubator and be a mother instead. Indeed. Then only can she transmit to her sons and daughters the qualities which make strong individuals and collectively a strong race. End quote. But she's not racist. So, wait, wait. (laughs) So, so was she a racist? Uh, Um... (laughs) So, I mean, th- none of this specifically says that she thought a specific race is superior or inferior to others. No, no, she never specifies which race is actually the strong race or anything like that. No. Dig dig as much as I did. I could not dig to that, uh, that gem. She is heavily connected to many who were widely accepted as racists. Uh, you know, including the KKK and uh, <clears throat> the Nazis. But she's not racist. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, we, we can't definitively say she is actually racist. But there's a lot of smoke pillowing on the subject. Just, just a little lot. And where there's smoke... There's a racist. Uh, I mean, I'm, uh, there's not. She is, though, an absolute lover of eugenics which by Planned Parenthood's definition is racist. But I... Um, we all, well, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that's, that's beside the point. <laughs> is, she only wanted it. She only wanted to, to put it in so that, that she could, you know, implement it among those that she thought were, were bad stock. It's just... A, just... It was it was just to to weed out the undesirables, right? Whose characteristics just so happened to line up predominantly with a certain race. Yeah. While she endorsed the, uh, she was far darker and way more twisted than any of the people she hated. <laughs> So her ideologies and advocacy led to the development of what is now called Planned Parenthood. It was called the Federation something. I don't know. I don't care. (laughs) Is that that a Star Trek reference? Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, Yeah. So Planned Parenthood now has a majority of its clinics found in or around minority communities and pushes abortions as safer than pregnancies for black women. It does. It does. They they put out a tweet. Um, Let's see. They put out a tweet back in 2017. If you're a black woman in America, it's statistically safer to have an abortion than to carry a pregnancy to term or give birth. Wow. (laughs) 
That could explain why New York sees more black abortions than it does black births. Potentially, yes. Yeah. Yep. She didn't explicitly say she was racist. Nope, she was not. But her work and vision are severely hurting increasingly more families, especially those in the minority category. Yeah. 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 That's a that's a that's a brief <laughs> snippet. Brief brief slice of the history <laughs> of Margaret of Sanger. Margaret Sanger. And uh if you want to uh for whatever reason follow along in some dark stuff um all the links of course will be uh below i guess um that we use to look at and check out the links below and you like subscribe comment do all those fun things and a couple of those links are to archive type things because well the new york university used to have a whole page dedicated to margaret sanger and her writings and her work and that disappeared around March 2021, hmm. which is around the Weird. same time that it came under fire for being racist because they supported Black Lives Matter from the year before. And people were like, hey, you support black lives, but um, history? <laughs> <laughs> and then it just magically appeared, their apologies for Margaret Sanger. And they even have a little video on there if you want to watch it. It's like a minute long or something where they basically say that the reason why we put this section in here on her history and that being racist is because it's socially and politically convenient for us to now admit that she was racist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so there you go. That's, that's our slice of history for this week. Hope you enjoy. Hope you enjoy. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Are we ready? Yeah, I've been recording this whole time. So have I. Yes. <laughs> I just I just needed it for the clap sync. That's ah. that's all I needed it for for at least wow. this part. Yes. I think we're All right. So, what's the game plan? Start it and just start reading or do we have a little intro you want to do or I th I think we can just get to reading cuz it's kind of got that Intro sorts, or I guess we could intro with uh, uh, kind of mentioning the Roe v. Wade current stuff, why it's relevant. Okay, to learn so about we'll run the intro music, and then you can run through the open, and then I will read it. Okay, cool. Let's do it. <laughs>